From the Sky Terror Wellness Retreat, this is the Inspired Intentions Podcast, where we help people build the skills and mindset to live a healthy life. I hear if you play music for your plants, they grow. Mm, I mean, they're going to grow regardless. I hear they grow better. There is something about like the tone of voice. I don't know about music especially, but I know like talking to your plants. Part of that is just like the exhalations of our breath. But I I mean, plants have all kinds of weird chemical signals. They're talking to each other all the time. So yeah, we've not even scratched the surface of all the things that plants tell each other. I read an article about a guy that played Mozart to his plants, Mm -hmm. his farm plants, like corn, stuff like that. Oh, okay. Just like broadcasted in the field? Grew twice as fast. I'm a little skeptical of that. I feel like maybe that's just covering up for some, like, super fertilizer he was testing. I don't know. I need (laughs) need more research to back that claim up. I'll be honest with you. I Um. want it to be true. (laughs) I want it to be true. Well, Inspire Intentions listeners, I am back here with... None other than Jess, our master gardener, if you couldn't tell who it was already this morning. And um, we are not here to talk about plants and music. No. We are here to talk about the ins and outs of composting. Um, and I'm very curious to see what it has to do or what it could have to do with your wellness. Welcome, Jess. Thank you. We have a compost here at Skyterra, yeah? Yes. So that was actually... The first thing that I did when I started working here was I set up our composting system. And is it what what type of composter would you consider that to be? So we have two different kinds of composting systems. Our our main one is an outdoor uh, hot cold pile. It's basically the the simplest and least effort way of composting. It's just a big old pile in the back of the property where we layer our food scraps and our you know, yard scraps from around the property, uh, leaves and twigs and um, grass clippings and things like that, in addition to everything that comes out of the kitchens. And, and the, the groundhogs love it. The groundhogs do love it, which is why it's outside <laughs> of the garden fence so that they can have their, their distraction feast and not come into the garden <laughs> and eat the, the actual garden. food. Yeah. 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 So the other kind of compost that we have is an indoor electric composter, and that's in the kitchens. And that is for uh, smaller scraps, like leftovers from plates and things like that. And that is all of the scraps that cannot go in an outdoor composter. Gotcha. That's our meat and our dairy and even bioplastics can go in that one. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Well, we are going to dive all into this and even more. And uh, I'm excited to learn a little bit more because it's something that we've always done where I grew up at, but something I've never known a ton about. So figured you would have composted a lot as a kid being a farm boy. Yeah. Oh, for sure. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. And you actually helped me pick out like a, um, a a big drum type composter Mm -hmm. for my mother for, was it Christmas? I think is when we got it for just like what the type was. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we've always been a thing. We had a big pit, but we even, broke into something new after your suggestion. So awesome. your wealth of knowledge on this. And I think where I'd like to really start is why should somebody even be worried about saving all of their scraps? Why should we why should we compost? Yeah. So there's there's two different ways that we can approach this. The first is just the the sustainability aspect of you know a lot of our food scraps currently are going into into landfill. And that actually makes up, I believe, over 25% of what goes into our landfills is food scraps. Mm. And they won't actually decompose and be composted in a landfill. They're just going to mummify and stay there and take up space. So that's one aspect where they're just staying, food scraps are staying in the landfill. They're not going back into the earth. And so we're slowly leaching nutrients, funneling them into the food that we're eating. And then the food that we're not eating, those nutrients are just hiding away in a landfill somewhere. So the, like where they pile and pile and pile, all that stuff at the bottom of the pile just never gets decomposed. Yeah, it never decomposes. There's actually been some really interesting pictures of people going into an old 1950s landfill and uncovering some of the, the bagged trash and finding newspapers that you can 
still completely read the date and the uh, contents of it and you know mummified apple cores and other wow. food scraps that are just still completely re- retaining their shape and structure and haven't uh, decomposed at all i mean that's like what 70 something years ago yeah i wonder <laughs> you know i bet you could go into a really old landfill and probably find some really like i'd be curious to see what the oldest thing was yeah you know yeah i mean there's all kinds of things that you'll find if you go in landfills and that's uh, a big problem with especially bigger cities is that we're producing so much landfill waste that we're running out of space to put it all and that leads to things like uh, incinerating which is just putting all kinds of chemicals into Mm. the air so basically taking that and burning it at a really high heat somewhere yeah yeah so if you're able to compost you're redirecting almost 25 percent of what's going into landfills and putting it back into the earth where it can create healthy soils and uh, continue to generate nutritious food for us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, then the other piece of that is the the emotional and mental aspect where even if maybe you're not super swayed by the idea of, you know, why do I personally have to compost and reduce my waste to save the planet shouldn't that be someone else's job or bigger (laughs) corporations um but there is all this also the the impact that composting can have on our own lives and our own uh feelings surrounding food in our community and so by composting i find that i am better able to connect with the people around me to feel like i am more a part of the cycle of life yeah uh, involved in the creation of healthy soils and healthy food. And it reduces a lot of guilt when it comes to food waste as well. Um, that's something that I've noticed a lot of guests come to Sky Terra with guilt about leaving food on their plates. And that's something that a lot of us were raised yeah. to never <laughs> do is to uh, waste food. So at least if it's going into the compost, it's it's not truly being wasted if it's able to go back into our food system. For Especially for that site, you know, the life cycle piece that you were kind of speaking towards there. I've, I've found that when I'm back uh, hanging out with mom and we cook a big dinner as we typically do when we're there, um, she has a bin that all of the scraps that are usable go into. And it makes me very incredibly aware of actually how much even just a small single household can waste. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like that bin gets full really quick off of one meal. Yeah, especially if you're a, a full household, you know, four plus people, even if it's just two people like my wife and I, we'll we'll fill up our our compost bin at home as well within one or two meals of of actually cooking healthy food. So if you're eating a lot of ramen noodles and things, maybe you're not wasting as much uh, food scraps. There's not as many carrot tops and lettuce cores and things like that. Sure. Yeah. So when we're trying to eat healthier, that's something that we start generating more food waste too. And you had mentioned something uh, a minute ago when you were talking about the indoor version of this, which we'll dive into, but there are certain things that you can't compost. Yes. Yeah. So really in, in a traditional outdoor bin, things like meat and dairy scraps, they will eventually compost, but in the meantime, they're going to smell really bad and they're going to attract animals. Okay. And that's something that a lot of people are worried about and maybe don't want because um, that can contaminate the, the value of your compost as well. So there's some things that are easier and less smelly if you're able to compost it in a different way. Ah, understood. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, Jess, tell us about this diagram. So listeners, there's a, a, a diagram that Jess printed off uh, on our kind of note sheet here for you. Uh, to imagine, it's uh, a semicircle, a little half circle here. Um, kind of in horseshoe shape and the top left hand side of the horseshoe says do and then the top right hand side of the horseshoe says avoid and there's a bunch of things in between those Um, so Jess why don't you describe what this is that we're looking at here yeah so this diagram is directly from the environmental protection agency's website it's um their, their newest version, it came out in October, and it is the Wasted Food Scale. And so this is basically a, a diagram of 
what we should do with our food waste from um, first to last. Okay. What would you call it? Yeah. So like maybe the, the way my, when you were explaining it to me earlier, the way my brain kind of uh, started was as soon as you're done eating, mm-hmm. you kind of look at these steps to see how it applies, applies to you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So you could look at this wasted food scale and determine and just go down along the scale on what you're able to do with your food waste. So the first thing we would want to do is prevent food waste to begin with. And that is like making sure you're only buying what you needed, using it up in a timely manner, and maybe even saving some of those food scraps like your carrot tops, garlic peels, onion peels, and making a veggie stock or something out of it just to further reduce the waste that you're producing. The next step would be to donate uh, unused food. If you've got something that you know is going to go bad, maybe it can go to a food pantry or or, um, a neighbor that might be able to better use it before it goes bad. Um, And then the, the step after that would be for people that might have chickens or pigs or some kind of animals that would be able to eat that food waste, even if it's just slightly beyond when we ourselves would be comfortable eating it. So that would probably be um, where you would start like after you've uh, consumed stuff. You have leftovers, mm-hmm. this kind of third piece to the puzzle. The first two sound like it's it's a little bit before that. It's just like a mindfulness about what you have in front of you and how to use it correctly. Absolutely. Yeah. So at, at this third stage where we're looking for what to do with our food scraps or slightly uh, past the, the ripeness date mm-hmm. for our food would be to try and use it to, to feed an animal that maybe is able to better process that or deal with that food waste. Chickens are a great example that a lot of people can have in their backyards that will eat all kinds of food scraps and be mm. very happy with it. And you can get some eggs. And yeah, you can get some eggs out of it. Is so. there, um, would you say that most people have some kind of farm near them that would accept stuff like this if they don't have animals of their own? So a lot of places do. If you've got a farmer's market near you or if you know of a local farm that's down the road or anything like that, if you participate in a a CSA or any uh, kind of community-supported agriculture, there's most likely a farm and a farmer that is more than happy to take any food scraps that you have to use for either feeding their animals or generating compost for their farm. Gotcha. So what's next on here? So next is the actual composting part. If you are able to compost something in your backyard, in your basement, on your countertop, anything like that, um, if you're not able to do any of those other steps, this is the next one is to actually compost your food. Right. Um, And then after that comes the more industrial steps of sending it to be uh, biodigested by any kind of company that might be creating biogas or anything like that. And that's kind of part of the landfill or uh, more industrial portion of it. So you can send your your food scraps off to be dealt with by someone else that will either be um, generated into biogas, that's the more preferred, or it's going to go down the garbage disposal in the landfill or incinerated. Gotcha. And the the avoid side of this horseshoe is red, just so <laughs> listeners know. <laughs> it's like, all right, you want to try to avoid this, you know, that landfill and that send down the drain are closer to that red color, whereas the prevent food waste in the first place is that, like, solid dark green, like, go. Mm-hmm. It's funny, though, that compost isn't first. We, we talked about three steps even before composting here on this kind of diagram that probably aren't things that people typically think about. Yeah, and so that's uh, a big piece of being more sustainable, being more mindful with the choices that you're making, with the food that you're eating, and kind of really appreciating the value that that food has that you know it was it spent months in the ground being grown by someone it was shipped to your grocery store where you picked it up and brought it home and uh, really being able to use that food and value it for the nutrients that it's giving you or that it could give a neighbor or even livestock or animals before we think about what comes next in its life cycle. Understood. So 
we say we have a guest or a listener that gets to the compost point and they're like, all right, so I did all the things that I could. Um, obviously I'm going to still eat some veg and, or whatever is the compostable and we don't want to just throw it in the trash and it gets sent it to a landfill. So we're going to go with that step before, which is compost. Mm -hmm. How does somebody start to do that? What does that, what does that look like? How does it work? So composting can be as hands off or as complex as you want it to be. There's so many different ways to compost. Uh, the simplest one is if you live in a, a city or a town that has curbside pickup or municipal composting available. That's kind of the most hands-off way is just to see if you can put it in a, a yard waste bin or some other kind of pickup or drop-off bin that your your city or town might have. And then okay they take it off to a, a big composting site and deal with that on its own. I didn't know that that was a thing. That's thoughtful. Yeah, so, so bigger cities have started to do that. Places like Austin and um, San Antonio and mm. San Francisco, all those big cities that have the, the means of doing that. But even Asheville and Raleigh um, in North Carolina, where we are, has composting options. We have drop-off sites. Oh, wow. So basically, it would be like you were saying, your mother would collect food scraps in just a, um, a bowl or something. And then yeah. instead of taking it outside to your own compost bin, you would put it in a bin to be collected by the city, and they would take it and compost Very much it. so like recycling, essentially. Yeah, basically yeah. just like recycling. Um some areas that are, are smaller, you might have to drive your food scraps to a bin, um, more like uh, multi-material recycling centers where you have to self-sort and drop off your food scraps as well. So that's one option that is very hands-off for you. All you have to do is collect your food scraps separate from your regular trash and then put it in a bin to be collected by whatever city you're in. Uh, if that's not an option, which in most of the U.S. it is not currently an option, yeah. Uh, the next step is to figure out if you want to compost it indoors or outdoors. <laughs> right. So this is where we kind of started, listeners. I was very curious about this indoor piece because that's something I don't know as much about. But mm -hmm. let's start with the outdoor. Yeah. So outdoor, it could be a, a tumbler. A lot of those are really common. It could be uh, a big plastic tub or something like that that is sitting on the ground open to the earth below. It could be homemade with pallet wood and scrap wood or whatever you can put together. It could just be a, a big old pile without anything surrounding it. Yeah. So outdoor composting is pretty much as simple as it get. We're trying to pile our food waste with other compostable organic materials from our yards and layer them in such a way that animals aren't going to come and be super attracted to <laughs> yeah. it. So we don't sure. just want a pile of rotting food in our backyard. We want a, a pile of rotting food mixed with dry leaves and grass clippings and things like that. And then basically you're just piling it high enough that the inside of that pile is going to start to heat up and it'll break down naturally over the course of several months. And like on a really cold morning, you'll see it steaming, right? You will, yeah. And that's it's very fun to see how you can turn it over in the wintertime and just see the steam rise off that pile. Or, do you know what is causing that? So it is all of the uh, bacteria and microorganisms that are naturally on our food and in the soil. And they are actively breaking down the food waste. They're digesting it. And in the process of their digestion, they are creating our healthy compost. Mm. And they're releasing heat as part of that process. Yeah. So out of all of those options, uh, what would you say is probably the most accessible to people? Well... I would say if you have a backyard, if you have any kind of land at your disposal, it is very simple to just create a simple pile. We want it to be at least three feet by three feet eventually mm -hmm. when it's cooking down. But I've been able to make them out of scrap wood, pallet wood that's very free. Um, in a lot of cases, you can find them um, very easily accessible for you. And just create that pile, add your food scraps and yard waste to it. Well, the one that uh, we got 
my mom is a drum one like you were mm-hmm. talking about that has a handle and it literally spins. It looks like the things that they draw like the lottery numbers out of, yeah. basically. Um, you spin it every once in a while and it kind of turns itself. Um, what's the purpose of that that spinning mechanism that is built into this like fancy one that we got off of Amazon? Yeah, so compost will break down faster if we're able to turn it in some way. Um, that way... There's always new material that's in the center of that pile, essentially, where most of the heat and gotcha. actual breakdown is happening. So the drums that have some kind of spinning or turning mechanism attached to it is just kind of a, a pre-made packaged yeah. way to, exactly. to do that process for you. And in North Carolina, actually, every May, there is a, a composter sale that the state funds so you can get uh, a home composter for 50 percent off or something like oh, that oh wow um and it is basically just a big <laughs> plastic drum where you put yeah. your food scraps in the top and then turn it every once in a while and you can get the finished compost out the bottom yeah she loves hers yeah yeah, yeah they're they're fantastic great. a lot of community gardens have them as well where if you don't have a municipal option available or you don't have an outdoor space you can bring your food scraps to a community garden and they'll usually have a compost system, and they're happy to accept scraps. Gotcha. The this is a random question that you're not prepared for. The do you ever or have you ever heard of somebody adding uh, earthworms to it? I have, yeah. So so worm bins in its own is a individual. It's a form of compost that you can do just with having worms either in your house or in your backyard and yeah there's a particular kind of worm that is really great at breaking down food i personally wouldn't add them into an outdoor bin because those worms are not native to the u.s um so i don't want to introduce non-native worms into the environment Mm. but if you were to have a, a worm bin say on your porch or patio or something, then that could be a very effective way to compost very quickly. Oh, that's, it's really interesting. It's just funny because my, uh, my nephew actually bought my mom some yeah. like <laughs> two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Worm bins are very fun, especially for, for kids to be able to see the exactly. worms breaking down the food waste. And um, you can add a lot to worm bins. The one thing that worms aren't very good at breaking down is citrus. So if you eat a lot of citrus, mm. that's something that the worms aren't used to having in their diet. So like lime, lemon, yeah. oranges, stuff like yep, that. Yeah, those kind of peels and things. Yeah. They'll take a lot longer to break that down if they touch it at all. Gotcha. Um, as far as outdoor goes, what else might somebody need to know? Mm, so for outdoor bins, the biggest things to to be wary of is that there are limitations to what someone at home can put in an outdoor bin. So meat, dairy, right. and bioplastics are the biggest ones that come to mind because our homes, the the waste that we generate is generally not in large enough amounts that it can break those down quickly enough. Gotcha. You're not going to have like a big enough pile to create enough to break it down. Yeah. Yeah. So most uh, industrial composting, they have like 20 foot tall piles of compost and the insides of those piles will heat up pretty quickly and they'll start to compost all of the um, meat and dairy and things that would be very smelly and attract animals and things much quicker. So our outdoor bins just, they're not going to get hot, hot enough. Right. They uh I'm I'm imagining and I'm I've seen this before that those the size of what you're talking about is something that they're they're turning and rotating with heavy machinery. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're coming in with their their big machines and turning that or it's going through big industrial processes to turn it (laughs) probably not doable in somebody's backyard yeah in our backyard we probably don't have any heavy machinery we're probably going to be turning our compost with a pitchfork and it's not going to happen as regularly as it would at uh, an industrial facility understood well tell us about indoor then if somebody doesn't have a backyard they don't think that they can work one of those tubs or they don't have one what what can you do inside yeah yeah so Outdoor bins, they're definitely for people that are a little more mobile, um, that you need to be able to 
bring your scraps outside and turn them. Indoor bins are, uh, they can be very high tech. They could be very low tech. I've already mentioned the the worm bins that Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people with kids like to experiment with. It's basically, you can do it with just plastic Tupperware bins and you stick your worms and your food scraps in there and the worms will digest the food scraps as long as you give them a steady supply. Yeah. Um, so that could be something very easily done indoors. And then you can take the finished compost to um, your outdoor plants or your indoor plants or your uh, local farm or anything like that. So worm bins, very simple way. Worms also create incredibly nutritious compost. You can actually buy worm specific compost in a lot of places. Oh, cool. It's called worm castings. Mm, I've seen that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then another kind of more uh, superfood type of compost is this Japanese term called bokashi. So bokashi compost is like a super fast fermentation process rather Mm. than waiting for all the traditional microorganisms and bacteria to break down that compost. We are inoculating our food waste with some kind of uh, fermented grain And that speeds up the process. And within a month, you can get finished compost out of it. Um, And that is for people that are very gung-ho about creating really nutritious compost that want to do it in a very efficient manner and then use that compost for something that they're growing. Um, And then the other ways that are easier for... Uh, us regular people that maybe don't have a lot of time to dedicate to composting or want to do it to help the planet and uh, all the benefits that we mentioned at the beginning, but maybe aren't super uh, gung-ho about the process and the benefits of composting. That is where some really cool technology has emerged. Yeah. And there's these indoor electric composters, which we have one in our kitchen upstairs, and I have one at home. They're basically the the best thing that my wife has bought me in the past five years. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had ours for almost four years now, and it is amazing how much food waste you can process and how hands-off it really is. Wow. This is a fairly new technology? Yeah, within the past couple years, I've seen a couple different kinds spring up. Um, Lomi is probably the most popular name uh, that has emerged, and that is a a subsidiary of Pila Phone Case Company, as well as TerraCycle. That's like this U.S.-based company that will recycle really hard to recycle materials, things okay. that couldn't go in our regular um, recycling systems. So those two companies came together and developed Lomi as a way to have ordinary people be able to compost in their homes and within a couple hours get a usable oh, compost wow. out of it. So it's very quick. How's it doing it? It's essentially, I like to call it a mixture between like a blender and a bread maker. Um, so (laughs) it's basically heating up and dehydrating your food scraps while also grinding it up into small pieces. Oh, okay. So, uh, Vitamix is another company that makes a, uh, indoor electric composter. And you can see with the, the blenders that they make that this is a unusual, but not unforeseen next step for them. Um, so we have a Vitamix composter upstairs in our kitchen, And both of them, they operate very similarly. It's like a one-gallon metal bucket with a blade at the bottom. Yeah. You could fill it with all your food scraps from your meals. Basically, as your food is being prepped, you can scrape your cutting board leftovers right into it. Um, Close it up. It's airtight. It's got all these charcoal filters in it. And then once you turn it on, it starts heating up and grinding up your food waste and just it takes a couple hours just a couple hours wow. so um wow the vitamix only has one mode the the lomi has three modes one's like super eco-friendly that uses very little electricity one is just the fast regular mode that you can get compost in like six hours out of it mm-hmm. and the other one is a bioplastics mode which i think is really cool that you can take 
your bioplastic you know, takeout containers. We have some cups that we use upstairs in our kitchen that are made of bioplastics. Um, Pila, the phone case co uh, company that, that Lomi developed this um, composter for, is made of a wheat starch bioplastic. So you're able to take any kind of bioplastics that come in to your life and, and compost it inside rather than having to send it off to an industrial facility. And how big is one of these things? Is it like a fridge? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's much smaller than a fridge. I would say it's e it's smaller than a microwave even. Um, it's about maybe like a foot wow. tall by like 18 inches typically. Um, and they come in varying sizes, but um, we have ours right on our kitchen countertop. There are people that have them sitting, you know, right by their garage door or under their sink, things like okay. that. No mm -hmm. smell. Nope, no smell. It's because of all those charcoal filters and the okay. airtight lid. Well, that sounds like a great option for people, um, especially like apartment goers. If yeah. You're living in a big city. Yeah. So I'm don't... living in an apartment and I don't have access to an outdoor space at my apartment where I could compost outdoors. So that's the best solution for us right now is to be able to generate all of our compost inside and then we can use it for our house plants or sometimes I'll bring it to Skyterra and add it to our gardens here yeah, or things ask. like that. Yeah. Um, it's great if you're in a small space, if you don't have access to any of those other methods or if it just, uh, you're attracted to something quick and easy and very hands off a great way to start to reduce your food waste and give back to the earth a little bit yeah that's awesome i think mm -hmm. uh, that's a really simple version of it makes it very accessible for people absolutely how much does one of those cost so they come at varying price points i've seen most of them cost around 350 to 400 dollars right now um gotcha. There's always sales going around. Yep. Like I would never buy anything at full price these days <laughs> with all the, the coupons and sales that yeah. are going around. Um, but yeah, so they can be very affordable, um, especially if there's something that you're, you know, you're investing in the long term. You're thinking of it not just as a way to reduce your waste, but as a way to um, connect with your environment, with your community, give back to the earth, create healthy soils reduce our guilt around food waste, all these different things that are are playing a part in reasons why composting is so good for us. And you're taking that and taking it straight to your garden if you have the option or straight to your flower bed or whatever mm -hmm. at, at your house. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I hear you always driving into the guests is uh, to get involved. And that gets you involved. If you have this compost, if you have this, even if it's from the countertop stuff, you go use it. I think you grow something beautiful and you keep that cycle going, which yeah. is really cool. Yeah, so you could take this compost and, and give it away to someone else to use, but it might also be a great catalyst to start growing something yourself if you haven't before. Even if you are in an apartment setting or don't have access to an outdoor space, there's plenty of ways to bring plants and, and life into your spaces. and Window seal, compost. herb pot, you know? Yeah. Just little stuff like that. Yeah, there's all kinds of ways to, to use your compost and bring something green into your life. And that's something I think I've got a couple podcasts on farther back about the yeah. benefits of bringing plants into your life. Absolutely. And this is just another part of the cycle. What, uh, what else do people start to see or notice, say they have this compost and they start using it? What, what all can they kind of expect? So in addition to what we've already talked about and, you know, reducing our food waste, uh, part of it is just we're taking our trash out less often. We're not putting mm. as much <laughs> into the trash. Love that. Yeah. Um, if you have a lot of problems with gnats and things like that, you're oh, yeah. <laughs> eliminating uh, your food waste starting to, to rot in your trash can before you take it out. So that's what my wife appreciates the most about having a composter is that we're taking the trash out less. There's less gnats. For me, it's more about the the feelings I have around food waste. I was raised by uh, an immigrant mother who's uh, a refugee from Cambodia. So there were a lot of uh, feelings of guilt that were imparted on me as a child about wasting food. 
and leaving anything behind on my plate. Clean plate club. <laughs> Clean plate club, it's part absolutely. Of that. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it's uh, it's helped me to listen to my hunger cues more and be more connected to my body about when mm. I'm full and being able to be comfortable with taking food that's left on my plate and putting it into a composter so that it can go back into the earth uh, rather than feeling like I'm truly wasting it and having it go into a landfill or anything like that. Uh, we're protecting our climate. We're helping to reduce emissions. We're saving land space in landfills, helping our communities out, um, just truly just feeling more connected to our communities and to the cycle of life and like we're active participants in the world around us. And that's what I think is one of the biggest mental aspects of starting composting. Yeah, that sounds like can't really think of any negatives to doing this, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds I like mean, it's just all great positive stuff. Great for you, great for our planet, great for your plants, all kinds of things. Gives you lots of options. Mm -hmm. So for all the listeners out there, Jess, what um what would you suggest the listeners do right now if they're curious, compost curious? <laughs> So the simplest thing would be to just look up what options your community has. If your town or city has any kind of composting options already that you can take advantage of, um, look into starting your own compost bin if that's possible, whether it be indoor or outdoor, and just look at ways that you can reduce your food waste or redirect it into a more efficient and productive and healthy way. And uh, if they have more questions, how can they get some more info on it? On so yeah, you can you can reach out to me. I'm a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> uh, you can book a session with me on Skyterra at home. If you're able to come to Skyterra, you could take any of my classes. I have a couple classes every week, and I'll I'll usually touch on composting in some aspect in all of them because it is such an important aspect of our planet and the plants that we grow here and you can reach out at inspired intentions at skyterrawellness.com that's, that's right that's the email address hit us up okay. anything else jess i think we've touched on all kinds of things we've yeah really dived into turn, how composting work we've, turn we've, the turned, pile. Oh, we've turned the pile which reminds me i need to go turn our pile too actually this week <laughs> well i'll let you get after it it's a beautiful day out there and thank you so much for being back on here. I definitely learned a couple things and we will have you back on soon. Again, and listeners, if you guys have any questions, uh, shoot us an email, inspiredintentions at skyterrawellness.com and we will catch you next week. Bye. Bye. The Inspired Intentions podcast is a production of Skyterra Wellness Retreat. Special thanks to our executive producer, Alan Broyhill. Send us your questions and comments to inspiredintentions at skyterrawellness.com. Subscribe on iTunes and everywhere podcasts can be found. If someone you know might benefit from this podcast, share Inspired Intentions with them and give us a five-star rating. Join us next week as we cut through the unrealistic noise on diets and fitness and show you how healthy living fits seamlessly into your already busy life. Thanks for listening.